Uh, let me. Uh, uh, okay, we got it. Okay, let me get going to the next uh, speaker. GS Sicken from uh, Ericsson. GS serves as Vice President and Chief Technology Officer <clears throat> for Regional Carriers at Ericsson. In his role, he's responsible for helping customers develop strategic plans to evolve their, to evolve their networks. So you can imagine, uh, he's got a lot to say about the evolution of 5G technology and how carriers will do this 4G, 5G coexistence. And joining him was uh, Mr. Mike Dano, who is Light Reading's Editorial Director of 5G and Mobile Strategies. And he has covered the wireless in industry as a journal journalist for almost two decades. He's not a stranger here, and we welcome him back. Uh, we are delighted uh, that he is here to share his, uh, his uh, thoughts and guide us in these uh, next two speakers. And now I'll turn it all over to GS and Mike for the discussion on maximizing 4G, 5G coexistence. Mike, <coughs> GC? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. After you. I'm supposed to sit out there? Yep. There you go. Okay. Ah. That's good. Well, uh, following an FCC commissioner is you not, don't have your... not too shabby. Yeah. Is it on? Can you hear me all right? Is this on? Can you hear me? Back no. On the back? No, I think you need all to turn right. it on. So it has a light. It says on. I can just, I'll yell really loud. And if everyone's super quiet, then, oh, that sounds... There yeah, we go. yeah. All right. all right. So we'll get started. I was going to say, following an FCC commissioner is pretty, pretty awesome. And That's pretty... a little step down for me, but, but uh, <laughs> uh, 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 having, to, having to deal with me. Oh, is it... Can you hear me now? Does it sound all right? Still not? All right. How's yours? Try Mine is working fine. There right. you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to listen to me either. Uh, but maybe we'll have a microphone that comes out. I'm sure they're working on it. Um, but I think what we'll do is go ahead and get started while they're working on the uh, volume. And then let me know when it comes on, and I'll stop yelling. Sound good? All right, uh, GS, thanks for coming. How long is 4G going to stick around? Long enough. It's, <laughs> I think it's going to be at least a decade, if not more, where we think that 4G is going to be around for quite some time. So 4G, 5G, it's going to coexist uh, for quite some time. Yeah, thanks. Okay, now that sounds right. I'm, I'm good? Good? All right. All right, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, all right, Ten, you said sticks ar sticking around for a long time. 4G is sticking around for a long time. I would say at least a decade or more. At least a decade or more. Uh, and so here we're going to talk about um, the, the, the move from uh, 4G to 5G. And so I think that is, that is a big question about how, how, long can we, how long can the industry uh, rely on those 4G investments uh, that they've made. When will, so if it's going to stick around for a long time, is, is there a sunset date for 4G? And, and if so, what, what might that be? So this is a tough thing for me to say, what's a sunset date for 4G? I mean, look, GSM is still around. It was supposed to have been shut down like about a decade ago. So wherever it makes business rationale, you're going to have the technology as long as it serves its purpose. And I think 4G, especially with 4G evolution, and then being able to work closely with uh, 5G, I think both 4G and 5G are going to be around for quite some time. And there's a big difference between 2G, 3G, and 4G. Uh, 4G and 5G are much more similar than 3G and 4G were, or 2G and 3G were. So that is why I think that with the common infrastructure, IP, with the common infrastructure, even on the air interface, and the ability to actually reuse stacks quite aggressively, I think it's going to be around for quite some time. Now the question is going to be whether it's going to be 4G, is going to be NSA of 5G, or is it going to be SA of 5G? Those are things that we can debate and discuss. Okay. But I still think that 4G and 5G are going to be around for some right. time. Um, and, and so and we're, we're here, we're talking about the transition from 4T, 4G to 5G, and not all of the operators, you know, we're, we're only mm -hmm. in the very early stages of 5G now. So I think one question that I think is, is probably on the minds of a lot of operators right now is how long can they wait before they launch 5G? Now, I'm sure as, as a representative of Ericsson, you're going to say not too long. <laughs> but um, I mean, is 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 next year too late to launch 5G? Is, is 2021 
too late? I'm kind of thinking like when, when, when do operators definitely need to get into, into 5G? I think it's going to be a little bit more defined on what their business is and impact to business without having 5G, right? So you're going to be competitive and you have to remain competitive. And the ability to remain competitive is that if the tier one comes in into your territory and a 5G symbol comes on, it doesn't mean that they're getting better coverage or better speeds or better user experience, but from a subscriber's perspective, they think it's a better network because I have a 5G symbol. So that is the marketing aspect, right? The question that comes in is that if I'm able to have an, have an upgraded 4G, I should be able to deploy 5G as soon as you get access to devices. And at least with Ericsson, what we say is you can switch on 5G just by software update, as long as you have upgraded your 4G network. Now, in the short term, I still think, especially with non-standalone, I still think that most of the tonnage is going to be um, delivered by a really robust 4G network. But you're still going to get the value prop of 5G, if nothing else, just from a marketing perspective. Okay. And so a, a, a big driver for 5G is going to be those 5G devices. They're going, to, they're going to come out. People are going to want them. Yep. And if their operator isn't supporting 5G, they may look elsewhere. I mean, the, the device ecosystem looks nice. Okay. The question is, will our CCA members get access to them? That's all a perennial question, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. OK. Um, so so uh, again, the, 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 the topic we're, we're here talking about is the transition from 4G to 5G. Mm -hmm. uh, and that becomes pretty complex pretty quick. Uh, and there's some new technologies that are, that are that are going to be available to operators to, to manage that transition. Yeah. Meaning, I guess, from my understanding, it's not the same as the transition from 3G to 4G. Yeah, and so maybe so, uh, the one thing I have heard about is uh, dynamic spectrum sharing. So maybe you can just talk a little bit about what that is and, and uh, why, why it's important. So I think I would actually take a step back and say, when Ericsson was looking at 4G, one of the f biggest issues with 2G, 3G, 4G was all about spectrum farming. So let's say you have 10 meg of carrier and you have two carriers on HSPA, so you had to shut down one before you could turn on 4G. So one of the good things about what we actually saw was why can't we not automate that process? So that's where dynamic spectrum sharing came in is basically I can now, on the same radio and the same carrier, basically support 5G and 4G devices simultaneously, and the amount of spectrum that's allocated for 5G is absolutely dependent on the number of subscribers or devices that exist in that sector. And right now we have uh, two ways of doing it. One is what we call as slow dynamic spectrum sharing, which is like every 100 milliseconds. I actually change what my uh, carrier is going to look like, how many resource blocks are going to be supporting 4G, how many resource blocks are tagged to support 5G. In the next uh, evolution, we'll be able to do it per TTI. So the good thing is that now the service providers don't have to worry about spectrum farming. They have the same radio, they have the same carrier, and you should be able to support 4G and 5G simultaneously and nowhere do you actually have to make this decision. Should I shut down or should I stop using 4G and allocate spectrum to 5G? It'll be done automatically for you. So there's no sort of, uh, there's no um, in, injury that they'll have in terms of launching 5G. You don't have to take resources away from 4G and give them to 5G. They can share it. Absolutely. And then the if I look at, but actually to make it even better, if I look at how the core is going to be developed for 4G and especially 5G non-standalone. Mm -hmm. You can utilize the existing core with some added software so that you are basically able to support both 4G and 5G on a non-standalone mode. It's only when you are looking at a standalone mode that you have to start thinking as about how you evolve your core network to be able to support what, what is known as option one, option two, option three X, and option one, okay. which basically and that's a big topic, and I, and I, I, think, yep. I think that's where we're headed, is a, sure. is a discussion about 
the standalone version of 5G versus the non-standalone version yep. of 5G. Um, and this is actually, uh, I'll do a little uh, uh, promo here. That's I've been writing a lot about this particular topic in, at, at my role in light reading. So if you're, if you're not a light reading subscriber, I'd encourage you to go to a light reading and go ahead and sign up. That's, that, that's all. Um, but uh, uh, like you said, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of discussion about the, the core network mm -hmm. and what it might look like and whether it'll be standalone versus non-standalone. Um, operators are, are universally selecting non-standalone yep. right now. Yep. And, and is, is there a reason to do that? The reason comes in primarily on the, on the core complexities. So one of the things that's required with non-standalone is that you can leverage your existing core because all control signaling coming back comes back to the 4G flight, right? And it's the user traffic, which is basically the traffic that you really have to figure out as to the scale of the traffic is going from the G-Node B onto the additional aspect, and we call it as 5G EPC. Okay. So that is why non-standalone was basically preferred right now, plus some other device and complexities. Standalone is, is, is it's not even ready yet in terms of standards. The standards actually do have, we have a version that is ready okay. that we can launch. What isn't done in standards is that each and every part of that standalone core is not fully standardized and all the features and functionality have been completely uh, ironed out. Okay. But there is enough out there to be able to do standalone. The question is going to be, where does the ecosystem come in? And why should someone go to standalone? And uh, as we talked about in the morning, there are some values when you look at what is known as dual connectivity or ENDC, where you actually dual, the device dual connects to an LTE and 5G, mm -hmm. and the ability to do carrier aggregation on a standalone case. So then all of a sudden, you actually have uh, an ability to carry aggregate a 600 megahertz, let's say, low band. You can do mid band and high band and basically get the ability to do stretch out the high band, which gives you the capacity that you're looking for. Hmm. Okay. Um, but, uh, but in terms of standalone, um, uh, you're saying that, that, that there is a reason to move to standalone in a, in a, well, I guess what is the reason? So if, if non-standalone is so great, right. why, would you, why would you then have to move to standalone? It's a couple of things. Okay. Number one is going to be all about your business, right? The thing about uh, having the ability to have a cloud native uh, kind of a, a core deployment, more IT centric, an ability to actually scale up, scale down, uh, have the ability to upgrade microservices so that you don't have to take the entire core down. Those are all benefits of standalone. The other part also is the ability to actually have a network that is 100% 5G, and therefore I can leverage the carrier aggregation aspects. Not saying it's not gonna be 100% possible on the non-standalone, but it is built in into standalone mode. Okay. So that's it's it's that's basically there the are some reasons, and and uh, you know from a cost perspective, uh, what it, what I what I am hearing too is that so you have your four G, you've got your non standalone five G, yep. and you have standalone five G. Yep. Now is that is that going to be really expensive to operate what what are essentially three what potentially are three different systems? So actually, I think what I would make well, what I would say is four G. And non-standalone 5G is basically the same okay. from a core Think perspective. Think of it to this, as the same. Think about it the same. It's just a couple of different additional software patches that come in to actually add and make a 4G EPC become a 5G EPC. Plus, and plus capable antennas. I mean, there's, there's that cost as well. There is capability that, uh, again, if I was going to, this is a small plug for Ericsson, is if I was actually going to say that you have the new radios or any radio that has been developed by Ericsson in the last uh, four or five years, they all are 5G capable. Small so you don't have to. Okay. Now, you do have to pay something to do upgrades and all that stuff to make sure. That's the point that I was trying to make is that don't forget your LTE network or your 4G network. Make sure that you keep on evolving that because that's going to help you so that you don't have to deploy new radios unless you're deploying things like millimeter wave and all which are uniquely 5G. 
and there's okay. no 4G on it. Okay. Um, and again, I want to go back to uh, to the idea of sunsetting. So we've talked about um, you know the the uh, dynamic spectrum sharing technology that yep. you sort of lets you ease into 5G as as uh, customers are added to that mm -hmm. network. Um, uh, I mean, what what does all this mean for for 3G and 2G and 4G? I mean, you know. Is there is there is there a time when operators can can begin budgeting for a 5G only network, and would they see a reduction in cost as a result? How should they think about that, or or are they really going to have to manage a 4G network in perpetuity and a 5G network in perpetuity? I think as far as 4G and 5G are concerned, at least the way we see it, it is just the difference on the air interface. But as far as your enode Bs are concerned, your genode Bs are concerned, it should leverage the same hardware. It's different software stack that's on it. So from a network perspective, from a, a deployment perspective, you don't have what we used to have before is you have a 3G site and right next to it you're sitting as a 4G site. So the 4G, 5G site, especially if you leverage dynamic spectrum sharing, is the same site. It's only on the air interface that I'm actually differentiating whether it's a 4G resource block or it's a 5G resource block. So from that perspective, it's, it's going to converge very effectively. The question is going to be is how long is 3G going to be lasting? That's a great question. Uh, I think a lot of the technology or the industry pundits basically said that GSM was going to be dead 10 years ago. My point has always been if it makes business rationale, then it's going to be around. If it doesn't make business rationale, then it's going to go down fa faster than slower. The other aspect is the growth of 4G, and especially the growth in 5G that we are seeing, it's even faster than 4G growth. So then the question comes back is, what is the economic, economical model to actually justify 3G, 4G, and 5G? Hmm. It might be, the answers might be different for different uh, service providers. The question that comes back is, is the ecosystem going to be there to basically go and support 3G, 4G, 5G, and maybe 2G? That's a lot of Gs. That's a lot of Gs. <laughs> That's a lot of Gs. Well, and now uh, people are starting talking about 6G. <laughs> We'll, we'll save that for next year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's great. I think we've run out of time. Please join me in thanking our excellent speaker today. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Gia. Thanks, really Gia. Appreciate it. And Mike, you're going you're gonna to hang I'm around. I'm staying right here. I, I, as long as that's working, we'll, we'll yes, let it work. Yes, we'll move. Okay. Uh, yeah, appreciate the, the insights and the ideas. Next, Mike will be joined by Josh Wigington, who is Vice President of Product Management of Interop Technology. Uh, t technologies. Josh Lee.